the architects are working it's on, on now? stage okay. set. <laughs> so we can say. Good afternoon. I'm Sylvia Carmen Cubina, Executive Director of the BAS, and I'd love to give you a warm welcome this afternoon to Curator Culture. We have a really wonderful group, um, probably the, smarty, the most smarty pants group we've ever had in Curator Culture. And I'd like to welcome the IKT. Everybody who's IKT, raise your hand. So the IKT is the International Association of Curators of Contemporary Art, and Miami is very lucky to have them here um, this week, and we are all very lucky to have them here today to see Sheila's show. So, of course, Curator Culture is sponsored by the Knight Foundation, who we'd like to thank profusely. And now I introduce our wonderful, amazing, ravishing moderator, Tom Healy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you all for coming on such a beautiful afternoon. And I hope you've been up to see this ravishing exhibition from Sheila Hicks. And it's a real honor to have you here and to have uh, my friends, uh, the extraordinary architects, Mark Lee and Sharon Johnston. So thank you all for, for, for joining us. Thank you. So I asked uh, for this group of people to come talk together because they have mutual interests in the intersections of art and, and architecture. And Mark and Sharon curated two years ago the Chicago uh, Architecture Biennial. And there was an artist that they wanted to include but whose schedule was too busy because she was doing a big installation at the Venice Biennale at the same time, and that's, and that's Sheila Hicks. So I thought, well, we could bring them together today. And so, <laughs> so welcome. Uh, we were just talking in the back a little bit about, um, about some of the people that, Sheila, you met very early in, in your career after school in Mexico. Luis Barragan among many, but you also studied with architects at uh, Yale. And one of the things you said, I wanted to see if you could start off with this, was <laughs> that one of the classes that was most engaging to you was going to the crits of Louis Kahn. Why, what was it about that that... <laughs> Did you guys go to Yale? <laughs> uh, no, Harvard. Harvard, of course. <laughs> <laughs> But we did meet with Vincent Scully, so. Oh, you did? We did, yeah. He went up to Harvard? Uh, no, I heard a lecture of his at Yale. Oh, he you came down to Yale, Yale. Yeah. okay. Seldom the Harvard people came down to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> we had to go incognito. I mean. <laughs> Gropius came incognito to visit Albers. I remember seeing him in the cafeteria. He didn't think anyone knew who he was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the Bauhaus characters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the question is about going to those crits that Louis Kahn did. Louis Kahn. Architecture mm -hmm. I, it, it's um, most of my memories are connected to um, stories of chance, mm -hmm. stories of, um, of not of my planning or of my scheming but of chance, and that is the Yale School of Art was annex and lex to the Yale School of um, Architecture on Chapel Street in New Haven. And the library was also there and used by both the architects and art students. And one day I got in the elevator and a man was in the elevator about my age, and he spoke to me. I don't know, do you speak to people in the elevator? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long line. <laughs> some, some cultures don't. In France, you know, like, France, we don't like speak to people in the elevator. Um, <laughs> and this, this man struck up a conversation, and I could hear his Spanish accent. 
and he was, he had a Fulbright scholarship. He was an architecture student, and he was studying to get his um, master's in architecture at Yale. And Louis Kahn was his crit, was his teacher. Well, I was interested, always thinking, how could I sneak into these criticisms, these crits, where they held uh, weekly or twice monthly gatherings. And I thought the way to get in there would be to make friends with this guy. And he was cute. <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> and he needed someone to help him build models. He was up against it. You know, what, remember what it's like, how tedious? Mm -hmm. He was redesigning the city, the capital of Teota in Spain, on, in front of Morocco. And so he was looking for help, or maybe pretending. Um, and he, so, so I convinced another guy who was a painting, I was a painting student, and I convinced another guy who was a painting student, Ernest Boyer, from Dayton, Ohio, to come with me, not to, get, to go alone, because we were all boys. There were very few women at the school then. Mm -hmm. um, and we went up and we started helping this man build the model for Theota for his thesis, for his presentation. And Louis Kahn, whenever he was around, would hang out in that room with us, mm -hmm. in that room with the five or six students. Jonathan Winter, Alan Fletcher, I think, was there. And then we'd go across the street to the Waldorf cafeteria and eat hor really junk food <laughs> after hours. Mm -hmm. And he'd sit there and eat junk food with us because where was he going to go? He lived in uh, Pennsylvania. And when he'd come to Yale, uh, it was kind of lonely at night. And we, so we formed a nucleus of just hanging out together, building that model and helping. Uh, and he had a great sense of humor. People took him very seriously. But you know, very serious mm -hmm. people can have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I got to know him rather well. And so when I received myself a full, this long, I'll make it short, I received a Fulbright scholarship at the end of that year to go to Chile as a painter, but interested in pre-Incaic, pre-Columbian textiles. And at one of these sessions in the, I think it was in the Waldorf cafeteria, these guys came up with the idea, well, if I had a ticket all the way to Chile, I went to the library to figure out where it was, I could turn it in and we could get two tickets. And Joaquin, Rayo, and I could go to Caracas. And he could get a job graduating from Yale in the period of the boom period in, in Caracas. If you were in that period, you would have done that too, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's when Bill and I mean, not going with me, but yeah. going to Karak. <laughs> I'll go with you, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and so we did. We turned in my ticket to Santiago, Chile. Mm -hmm. And we went, Rayo and I went on a car, Brazilian cargo plane with five re, and a whole load of refrigerators um, and five passengers. We got off in Caracas, and in two days he had a job with Tomas Sanabria. Mm. Imagine. <laughs> and Louis Kahn was really proud of him. Yeah. And me too, for getting him. <laughs> and that was quite a journey, it seems like, getting to Chile. You went through Venezuela, you went Well, then to, I didn't have any uh, plane ticket. Ecuador. <laughs> that was the end of my plane ticket. So then I had to be very clever about how I was going to get to Chile from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So if there is the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> I think only the outlines of it. But well, so, I think you know, the, yeah. for those who uh, know Louis Kahn's work, one of his most important buildings is the uh, Salk Institute in um, La Jolla, California. And there was a famous story when uh, he was designing the, 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 the plaza. He actually, the original design had trees there. It was a garden. But he invited Louis Barragan to come up to consult while, the, while it was under construction. And, and the story was that Louis Barragan told Louis Kahn and said, Louis, you don't need a garden. You need a piazza. You need a facade for the sky. And, and, and I think this collaboration is always an interesting story. And, and Barragan is another 
character that Sheila you had contact and friendship with after Chile, huh? Mm -hmm. Hmm. What do you want to know? Well, I'd love to. Uh, <laughs> we, we heard the behind the scenes stories about the photograph you took of him and Matthias Gertz, you know? I'd love to hear how you work together. Do you have the photo? Oh, uh, oh I have the book, yeah, yeah. yes. This is a great yeah. story, you have to hear. <laughs> I don't think you find it. This is a book that uh, was put together by uh, Frédéric Bonnet, French art critic and uh, connoisseur and uh, curator, and who also curated the show we have upstairs here. And uh, this is the catalog of the show we did in Mexico last year at Amparo Museum in Puebla. Mm -hmm. uh, and we invaded my archives and found a lot of old photographs. I used to photograph a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Herbert Matter was the photography teacher mm -hmm. there when Albers was there too. Mm -hmm. And so I had a rolly, rolly cord. I couldn't afford a rolly flex, but I had a rolly cord mm -hmm. with a square format. Uh, it was my best friend, my neighbor at all times. Protection too. Mm -hmm. um, and after lunch one day, I took a photograph in the house of Luis Paragan. Calle, Calle Juarez in Mexico City. Um, of these two men who were very close friends. In fact, Matias introduced me to Luis Barragan. And I'd go there for lunch when I'd drive up from the ranch where I was living to teach in the uh, architecture school in Mexico City mm -hmm. once in a while. These two guys, can you imagine, you're associates and working together for a long time? Yeah, 20, 20 years. years. Yeah. 20 years. God, it's terrible. These two guys had an argument about a project. <laughs> Los Torres Satellites in Mexico, mm -hmm. on the road to Puebla, mm -hmm. these towers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whose idea was this? It was a very successful project. Mm -hmm. It must have been an idea that was born out of these two geniuses at lunch. Mm -hmm. Both of them were the author of this project, mm -hmm. but they both somehow felt that each of them was the unique author of this very famous and successful yeah. project. <laughs> when it flew, you know, when it was built and they had really made... And so Matthias published in Europe extensively, very proudly, about his project in Mexico. At that time, we were not connected by internet, so if you took a plane from Mexico, went to Europe, and published and made friends, you, were, you didn't think the news would get back the same day. It's your other friends. <laughs> you had a face. Mm -hmm. um, but the news got back to Luis, and Luis cut Matias off. Mm -hmm. So when Luis Paragan, some year, not so years, some months later, received the Pritzker Prize for architecture. Mm -hmm. oh, he was honored also at the American Institute of Architects mm -hmm. and made a, a fellow. A fellow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He took the photograph that I had made of them and he asked me to reprint it without Matthias. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, to recrop it. Re which I did, and it became his favorite photograph, which he used for all of yeah. his promotions. <laughs> yeah. But it just, you know, you can just, like, if you get divorced or whatever, yeah. you can just... <laughs> <laughs> Always cut it He didn't just cut him off, he cut him out. <laughs> <laughs> right out of Sheila's photograph. <laughs> Terrible how you can just... Just do that. Just do that. <laughs> so, I want to ask you uh, another reason that I was interested in having you three together is Sheila's had an extraordinary career that's um, been on, I don't know if you've been to Antarctica, but other every other continent and uh, hundreds of countries. And in part of that history, there's been this whole question of looking at tradition, uh, pre-Columbian histories and, and ancient techniques of, of 
fiber work and weaving things. And you did a, this biennial in Chicago that was called Making New History. And one of the things you said, Sheila, in a conversation about that that I found really quite wonderful was that in this modernist impulse to kind of obliterate history and only make things new, you, you both have had a practice and teaching that's been about engaging with history. And one thing you said that history is actually about future horizons. And I was hoping you could elaborate on what that means to engage with the past and what it means for, for architects making things new. You, you oh, Sharon, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think for us, the biennial um, was, you know, it was a pretty, it was a tremendous undertaking, but I think part of why we wanted to do that was to, um, to build a platform, to build a discourse among architects and artists, uh, because, you know, we, we feel that we, we, we also teach and have our practice, and the idea of bringing um, a large group of, of creative people together around a set of ideas is, is a way to do that, is a way to, you know, in, a, in, in the way that we all communicate and the sort of fastness with which things happen, the idea of literally coming together physically in a place to have exchange around ideas that we share, I think is an incredibly rare um, luxury. And so Mark and I took the project on, and I think, you know, it was particularly relevant to be doing it in a Chicago a place where, you know, at least in our discipline, um, some of the, the most important sort of innovations in architecture and engineering had happened. So it was a place ripe for, for, for a discourse both about history, but, but, but for us, I think the idea of making a history, it came from the title of an, a book by Ed Ruscha, and it's quite a thick book. And the, that title was inscribed on the edges of the paper, um, but, but of course, um, leave it to Ed Ruscha, uh, all the pages were empty. And so this idea that you're looking back to project to the future is um, something that we loved. And so uh, I think, maybe Mark, do you want to add? Yeah, I think it's also interesting that this year is the 100th year of the Bauhaus. You know, Gropius, Albers, they all came from the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was very much about breaking with history. It happened during between the wars, you know, so there's this whole radicalness about life is changing, the world is changing. But we, we thought when we look back in history, we think back of uh, moments or height, at least the height of Western civilization, whether it be the Enlightenment or the Renaissance, they, they always look back. They always, at least architecturally, they always go back to the classics, you know. So I, I think it's for us, it's, a, it's an important moment, again, to think about the future in relationship to the past. So Sheila, <clears throat> I've gotten a sense in the little that I've, I've known you that uh, you like being provocative and breaking uh, traditional boundaries <laughs> <laughs> of things. And certainly in uh, the whole world of textiles and fiber art, you have not been a traditionalist by any shape or form, but uh, you have yourself looked to very old traditions of, of weaving and making from uh, pre-Columbian civilizations to Japanese and elsewhere. I'm interested in how that sense of making something new out of a great reverence for and understanding of the past, how does that go for you? Yeah. Big question, wait, the big question is, when you cross two threads or two lines, and you look at how others did it in other countries, in other civilizations, in other timelines, and you see how they crossed, or somehow wove, or looped, or caused two lines to meet in some way, how did they do it? How would you do it? Can you do it better? Or can you do it as good? Um, you're building horizontally. You're building vertically. You're going to look at the past. You're going to try and do it better. That's what I've been trying to do with, I can't face, I'm not up to the challenges of architecture like you are but I can do it very modestly with 
threads and little constructions that start to move in space. So almost like little tiny architecture or sculpture. And then other people with big imaginations can help me to build it into a larger format. But then do I have the right to sign it? <laughs> because that was the discussion at lunch today. Matthias Gerritz, we were referring to. How is it that the architects sign these buildings when all they've done is on the tablecloth drawn some lines? <laughs> <laughs> we actually do not sign them anymore. <laughs> but I, I think it's an important question in terms of, uh, you know, not just the conception of the piece, but also the making of the piece. You know, there's a, uh, I think for us as architects, we're always, there's always an intermediary. What we do is not actually the work itself, you know, but a blueprint, uh, a roadmap for the work. You know, I think, I think this has to do with the question of scale. You know, I think sometimes the larger it is, the more intermediary steps one needs to take or more people needs to be involved to complete the work. I, I think that's one of the reasons I'm very fascinated by the, uh, the small pieces in the show with uh, they're your sketchbooks, you know, that I understand you have a small loom, and then sometimes instead of sketching, you would just weave something out, you know. And, and they are, I understand they're works on their own. Huh? They're not necessarily studies. Huh? Sometimes they're, it has a kind of small immediacy, you know. Certainly the larger, beautiful pieces, one can imagine the labor that it takes into it, and also the subsequent spatial effect it has, like the biennial piece against the wall was so impactful with the two, red pieces hanging on both sides and the, and the shadows of those pieces. But those small pieces has a certain um, immediacy about them and a certain intimate scale. I think when one sees it, you know, there's a certain size and it's just yourself and the piece. And I think that's something that is very uh, fascinating that, about that. I think in architect's work, is perhaps that happens in a sketch, perhaps, you know. But so I want you both to elaborate on this a little, if, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I have the sense that your architectural practice partly begins by you being investigators and anthropologists, that you really study a community, a city, and a site for a long period of time before you even start to sketch. And Mark, you talked uh, once about um, a book called Four Ecologies uh, of Los Angeles. And I know a lot of the curators here, their, their subject is about ecology, uh, resilience, and sustainability. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about what the ecology of a place means and, and how that shapes what you make. Well. You know, there's, there's the old adage that uh, all architects are formalists. They just have different ways of lying about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, I, I mean, I, I think at the end, what we do, because there's so much money involved, there's so much, in a way, a certain permanence involved in what we do. So, in, uh, uh, so there are a lot of contingencies. So we have, to, we have it's an imperative that we consider all these issues uh, about the ecology of the place not just of the moment, but what will happen 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, certainly, when we build in Europe, we plan the buildings to last for 100 years, where in the US, perhaps, uh, you need a makeover in 20, 30 years, you know? But, but there are different temporal dimensions. Right? Certainly, uh, a building relates to the making of a city, and the city has to, make, has to do with the making of a larger ecology of a region. So this is something that um, we always are engaged in, no matter what scale of the building we're working on. I think also maybe to elaborate on that, but to come back to Sheila's question about material and sort of there's both the research, the testing, the mock-ups, the sort of scale from the model to the mock-up of the building. But I think more and more, I mean, as we become in a way more alienated from, from the final object of the building, we're also trying to sort of get closer to people that build our buildings. Um, so for example, we just finished uh, a small museum on the Manil campus. It's called the Manil Drawing Institute. And it's clad in uh, a kind of a cypress. So it's a wood, it comes from um, Washington State. And 
it seemed relevant that the building would be made of wood. Renzo Piano's building was made of wood, but we needed to find a way to express um, this building and the intimacy of, of um, the works, the, the works on paper. And so we spent quite a long time in this um, gentleman's studio in, in uh, Washington, gluing wood together, um, figuring out the, the dimension of the wood. Then we felt the texture was too slick. So much of architectural materials today are come in a very sort of commodified, panelized way. And so we figured out a technique to blast the wood with um, peanut shells. And so the grain became much more porous. And then that was quite beautiful. Without us doing any, applying anything to it, we actually found a texture that was inherent to the wood. And then we oiled it. And so I think that that getting close to how you make things is something that we can't always do. But I've, I think the sort of culture of how not only the history of the place, but um, the people who make it is something that's interesting to us. Because I think it sort of question of craftsmanship and architecture is, um, you know, slowly going away at many on many levels. And I think getting back to that, there's a sort of resistance to it that we find interesting and, you know, brings our hand back into the building. I found a wall around the corner here, before you go upstairs, mm -hmm. of this um, stone. Mm -hmm. This building is quite strange because it keeps changing as you move. It's maybe a few buildings, I guess. Um, but as you go around the corner here, I found a wall of this stone mm -hmm. and of course, I'd been hanging for 10 days an exhibition in the exhibition spaces, which are beautifully finished, white, mm -hmm. perfect walls. But I kept migrating back to that little corner over there in the back of that stone wall. Mm -hmm. And that's my favorite place where I put my favorite work. Mm -hmm. And they said, you can't touch the stone wall. <laughs> you can get close to it. <laughs> How am I going to get it up? What would you do? <laughs> you should just do it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, very clever Venezuelan craftsmen who work on Sylvia's staff here studied the problem and found ways to crawl up into the ceiling skylight in this kind of strange leftover space where these two buildings join here, these two. And they crawled up into the empty space where there's a skylight, meaning you had natural light pouring mm -hmm. in, and found ways to hook in, not on the wall, but in the plaster. You'll see. I invite you to come and see how we managed. No, I, I was telling Sylvia when I first came in to see this, I, that piece, I fell in love with it and that location, I said, this is perfect here. And she said, it's the first time we've ever put anything on the wall there. It's, so, it's why is it your favorite piece? Why did I make it? You, you said it's my favorite piece. It's my favorite piece because it, the, the, um, I think it has to do with um, fusion. I've been thinking about fusion for the last 24 hours. I woke up in the night thinking about fusion. I think fusion, it has to do with one thing playing off against another thing and not in an oppositional way, but in a way that complements and helps. One helps the other. And that the energy that comes from this meeting place is a kind of fusional powerful energy, because it's a surprise element. I love it too, I was, I was just curious to see, yeah. So I want to ask you about making space by installing the work, because we were talking in the one room upstairs where a version of the uh, piece from the Venice Biennale is there are two large, beautiful red pieces that shape the room and your experience of, of that. How, what goes into thinking about shaping the space of, of your installations that way? Here's a hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> My gal 
my, my gallerist, my gallery tells me. Those aren't your work. You made those in a s studio in Guatemala. You didn't weave those. A bunch of Guatemalans wove those. How are you going to sign those, and how am I going to sell them as your work in the art world today? I'm not the only one up against this. All the artists, I mean the architects obviously, but all the artists are not making each and every inch of every work that they produce, and yet they have the gall to sign it and turn it over to a commercial enterprise to market it. Can I ask you how you feel about this? Because people even buy my work have the nerve to die and leave it to their children, and they don't know what to do with it <laughs> because it's a bunch of pieces or panels or uh, elements. And so, to be fair, they divide them up amongst all the cousins. <laughs> and then someone needs some money, and they go to a gallery and say, can, you un can I sell this? And it's a Sheila Hicks weaving. And you look at it and you say, we got to get a certificate of authenticity. Do you have to deliver certificates of authenticity to your work? Haven't had to yet. <laughs> well, there's one piece that you've, you've made the shift with, uh, the piece that you first designed, uh, built, made for the uh, Target headquarters, and then it was gifted to a museum, I think, in North Carolina, South Carolina, and you made it into a five-story uh, vertical piece instead. What was that experience like of remaking a work for a different? I do that all the time. Right. In fact, the man who helped me do that is here. Where is he? Enrico. <laughs> <laughs> I made a circular work for the Target headquarters in Minneapolis. Target was so successful, they turned all of their public space into offices because they had so many employees and so many orders. So the art goes out. No room for art, only business. <laughs> um, call the artist and ask her what we should do with it. Because otherwise they just throw it away, you know, it just disappears. Because who's going to sell it? It's all pieces of things coming out of these very big projects. I gave, I put the signal out and asked a few museums if they were interested. But the stipulation was, if you take it, don't put it in the warehouse. If you want it, you Target will give it to you. <clears throat> but I'm going to influence them that it should be seen, it should be on display. The Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina said they would do it. But when we went to see the space that they were offering, it was a five-story lobby space atrium. So we took it all apart and we drew and lived in that space and reconfigured the space, and we just put it up as a, another composition. That's kind of blasphemous in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we gave it a new name. Yeah. <laughs> and it was evolutionary, you know? It was an evolution. Let the piece go along. If a building falls down, can you pick up the bricks and rebuild it in another way? I mean, all these well, disaster areas, you have to. Well, well, I think there's a difference. The difference between an artist and an architect is that when, when we sign something, we actually have legal liability. <laughs> if the building falls down, so. <laughs> but uh, I, I think. Um, yeah, but a, a cyclone or something destroys it, and you've got the bricks. What will you do with them? Shigeru Ban, what does he do when there's a disaster area? Yeah. Recycles. Recycles, yeah. No, I think. Yeah. Recycles. Yeah. Well, and that's something you've talked about in your teaching and writing some is this sense of 
the impermanence of, of architecture mm -hmm. and the desirability of thinking that through and not being attached to, uh, you know, that iconic status mm -hmm. with your name attached to it. Could you talk a little bit about that, Sharon? Yeah, I mean, maybe in a couple different ways. On the one hand, I think we really do enjoy doing works that are inherently have a time duration, like exhibitions or different kinds of pavilions. So I think for, for us, that kind of work is, um, you know, it's a kind of R&D moment. It's a sort of mock-up for something else. And I think, like Sheila talked about, the sort of recycling of things, of testing at one scale and, and then translating that into another, literally with the same material or with the conceptual ideas, is something that we find um, really nourishing. And I think that's partly why we, you know, artists are often part of those 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 projects. Um, but I think, you know, on the one hand, I would answer your question by saying we're not necessarily interested in architecture that's architecture that moves or architecture that's mechanic or things that move. But we are interested in qualities of um, ephemerality and adaptability. So, you know, we try to think about our work that's um, that can be transformed. When we think about you know, buildings that last 50 years versus those that last six months. It's a very different sensibility of space making. I think there's also a way we try to engage in qualities of light, qualities of time, things, you know, how does gravity work in a building? How does time work in a building? Things that make you, make bring a sense of presence to the building that um, allows it to engage those things that are, you know, on the way towards entropy, on the way towards falling apart. I think those are qualities of, um, maybe Sheila, you talked about the sort of tension of something when something feels very finished and stable and light hits it or, um, you know, the acoustics are different. I think there's a kind of way space comes alive when those qualities of permanence and impermanence meet. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, what, of the word fusion that um, Sheila just mentioned. I think this is something we always try to do of, like blurring the boundary of the threshold of where the architecture stops and everyday life begins. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I see a lot of that uh, fusion on the, in this show. I, I, I don't know if anyone has seen the Venice Biennial piece uh, where it was installed. There are these old walls that Sheila inserted, these red fiber, mm -hmm. and it's so magical. But when, before I started here, I was thinking, well, how would it look here? It's right. like white walls, it'll be kind of septic. And then she put these two great red pieces next to it. I mean, it's so anti-intuitive, but it mm -hmm. creates that kind of context, you know. And, uh, and, we, and you know, we lit it, and we lit it, we did the lighting so that the two red panels uh, cast a shadow on yeah. the white yeah. walls. That's the trash idea. And you see the lattice work yeah. Yeah. that you see through, yeah. and, and who put all these holes inside the panel? Mm -hmm. yeah. They were woven. It was, it was the first thing that Sharon showed me when I saw her today, a picture of that light coming through those panels. But it, it's, they're not mine, you know, they told me, because I made them in a Guala, Guatemalan workshop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the Guatemalans so are I'm beautiful. getting the, the signal that, that they're about to chop my head off, I think. So uh, I do want to end with one, one last question. For you, Sheila, uh, you you said somewhere that I read that it all begins with color. Mm. So here's my question: Is there a color that you really hate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> Good, she's just pointing and not saying. So we're, not, we're all we're good. Clear. No, we're all good. I don't so, want to go on record. <laughs> so we're going to open up to questions now. Uh, Kylie has a mic, and, and there's another mic here. So just raise your hand, and they'll bring a mic over to you and uh, ask a question. Yes, sure. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know it was my turn. Uh, thank you very much for, for the enlightenment panel discussion. I have a totally different question. And I, I would like to talk about, I would like to ask you, Mrs. Hicks, about the relationship between textile and gender. 
and one of your teachers was Annie Albers. She was at Bauhaus. Bauhaus uh, is supposed to be a very innovative school where, uh, as you know, the female pupils had to pay more than the male pupils, and they were kind of forced by Cropius into the textile department. They were really forced into that department, and they did great jobs. And I discovered that Mondrian, the famous Dutch painter, was influenced by abstract textiles from the 19th century. And I believe there is a, a, a connection between the invention of abstraction and textile workers. And I wonder how you, uh, did you ever, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, sorry to, to be speaking so long, since we have so short time, but I wonder, could you say something about this relationship between abstraction and gender and, and textile? Because you, in your work, you, 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 you take the grid, you take this abstraction, which goes back for centuries in many, many cultures. And it's, it's, a, it's as if only European and, Af and America can have invented modernity. But I think modernity has, is going way back, and you show it in your work. The question was about gender, relationship with abstraction, and, and textiles. You know, I get this question frequently, and I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> Are you European? It's a very prevalent question. Are you German, Dutch? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, most of the very large weavings I've done, for instance, the white panels upstairs that are handwoven, were all done by men in husky men in India on the Malabar coast in Calicut. Um, the Guatemalans who are weaving are men as well. It's heavy work, you know, it's tough, heavy work. Uh, they're not feminist in any way. You know, they're feeding their families as best they can, doing hard work. Um, <clears throat> abstraction. Uh, you see, my work, it, it looks like it's abstract, doesn't it? It's all about something. Look at the titles. It's going in like a poet, looking for the right verb, mm. the right movement to cause you to look. I'm trying to lead you to look, and I'm looking for titles to get you in. Mm. Because if you're not visual, at least read the title and then use it as a trampoline to jump in. Mm. And I don't believe that men or women are better or worse in terms of poetry. Or, you're, or disadvantaged. And this Bauhaus mythology stuff, um, what does it have to do with us now? <laughs> I'm sort of here and now. Mm. We've got to go forward. Sheila, you were talking today about Matthias, conversations with Matthias. Matthias Goeritz. Matthias Goeritz and education and the art today. Would you elaborate a bit on that? You had a wonderful relation with him and he was a modernist and you were a modernist. I don't get this modernist business. <laughs> well, about... I mean, that's art historian talk. <laughs> True. <laughs> and art critic talk. True. <laughs> but uh, 
you do what you have to do and what you feel. And in the times and the geography and the place and the situation, if you're called and sent to Sumatra mm -hmm. to work on a project, are you going to be a modernist or are you going to be just alert, like you were saying, mm -hmm. to what was going on mm -hmm. around you and how you're going to manage to do something significant? We've been called much worse than the modernists. <laughs> <laughs> Minimalists, Minimal. which we, which we are absolutely not. <laughs> Minimal. It starts. It starts with tying your shoes. What, what'd you say? I didn't get it. Start with tying shoes. <laughs> We're tied. We tied. Yeah, we have the shoe tied over here. <laughs> Look at that. Another question? Look how they tied their shoes. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk about... Oh. Yeah, it's coming. Um, I'm just curious. You talk about places that your work is done. Can you talk about workmen? Because people like Alan Atsui, um, who... who? Elon uh, his practice deals essentially with other people making, their work, making his work. I'm just curious about, he, he engages in the economics of a whole town and, and is very conscious of the kind of support that his work brings to. And I know that um, there are other artists today that are very conscious of the economics of the place. Are you engaged with those economics Emma, or do you does somebody process this for you? Are you engaged with the actual working people that make the work? And what, you know, how, they, how that affords them a living? And I'm just curious about your engagement with that because you said you want to be today. Well, today there are artists that are really engaging in this issue of the economics of art making and how it affects the community that makes the art and how it comes back to them. Yeah, I answer the phone at my studio. I answer my own phone. I don't have these intermediaries saying, Le Pala. Um, I answer my own phone, and every week I have calls to help engage in some kind of process or work that has social implications. Is that what you're asking me? I was actually dealing with the economics of it. Well, like the economics are people are trying to make their living and working and making an honest living by using, you know, manual labor. And I'm, in, I'm often approached to try and engage with all these people who have fantastic plans or schemes or foundations or funds. You must be too. Mm. And that's what caused me to, I never was a tourist. That's what caused me to go to South Africa, to uh, India, to Morocco. Each time was on a job, on a mission, on a challenge. And it all had to do with economics. It had to do with people who wanted to work. And they wanted to work creatively and productively. And they thought I was, uh, naive enough to put my finger in the, in the dike. It, see, like in the 80s, someone like John Ahern would um, actually, the model, the model, he, he, would have two, uh, he would have three sculptures made, three editions. One he kept as the artist, one he gave to the model, and the other he sold. Uh, and, all of the uh, projects that I've done in places like India and Morocco, um, you saw the very large prayer rug upstairs, the Moroccan prayer rug. Did you see a signature? No signature. They made as many as they wanted to make. I made a model, I made models. I never signed or asked for any royalties, like a designer. Mm. I worked, enjoyed, learned, and encourage them to kick off things. In India, there's a white, there's a white panel that's called Badagara in the middle, in the far room. Woven, all white. Someone asks me, how many are they of this panel? 
I said, there are kilometers of this panel. And they laughed, you know, Sotheby's Christie's call, we have one, a piece of this, we want to sell it like a tapestry. We want to give it a price and put it on auction. I could sell it, but there are hundreds of kilometers of it there is out there. <laughs> because I made these designs in India, and they wove them and wove them and wove them. I'm so pleased someone bought this piece, some English gallery, Alice and Jacques, your boss, <laughs> bought this where? And washed it and cleaned it. And she said it cost her a lot to get it in shape. <laughs> and then put it in the fair, which is called, where? Miami Basel. <laughs> there it was hanging on the wall in the Miami Basel Art Fair. And she bought it, right? And she's trying to sell it. Take a look upstairs. But Sheila, <laughs> do you work with the same mills and, and the same craftsmen again and again? Like, do you go to India for certain projects and I, Mexico for others? I'm old. <laughs> but I did. You did? For many years, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what and I do, you know, I'm... Here comes the mic. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I think that your weavings show a great connection between material and color and light. And I'd love to know how you think about material in a way that creates light. Mm. Texture, texture, texture. texture. Fusion. Huh? Fusion, energy. Get material like texture color, light, huh? you get a fusion going and you get energy. And it's not only energy there, it's giving you energy. And last night when people brought children to the opening of this show and they let them loose, <laughs> they would crawl over and park and lean themselves up against the wall that you like in the end. Mm. And then the parents would come and grab them and take care of them. And they would release themselves and crawl back again over it. <laughs> it's an energy. I think uh, a lot of art today is confrontational. I'm not going to be an art critic today, but mm -hmm. a lot of art is confrontational, thought provoking, needs to be, causes us to stir our minds and. Uh, activate us, to become active, use it as a vehicle for activism. Uh, I'm so engaged in giving energy and life reinforcing messages. But in my studio, I take all the time apprentices and people working who are all activists in one way or other, you know, from Brazil, from Korea, from Japan, from, and this, and we all have lunch together. And they all refuse to eat what the others are eating. Strength. Each one wants to eat their thing, whatever it is they like. Do you have this problem? <laughs> we try not to make it a problem. <laughs> but yes. You know, vegan and super. Yeah, we, uh, we yeah. do have a vegan one time, and it was not yeah. convenient. <laughs> what do you do about all the hair? You use the mic. We, we, we take them to, Mark likes to take everybody to dim sum. Everyone can find something they like there. Everyone bring <laughs> No, they go out for Chinese dim sum. Ah. We, we have like open house around a big, long table. And if someone comes to see us and they want to visit the studio, we say we're working. But if you want to come for lunch, you know, we'll break. They come and sit with us. Um, and the wildest table, right, Frederick? You've seen it. Uh, what shows up for lunch? Everybody eating and everybody insisting that everybody tries what they're bringing. <laughs> and most of it looks god awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all. Uh, just a quick question 
love to hear you talk a little bit about Escalade Beyond Chromatic Lands because it's so beautiful and magical. The artwork, the big artwork, the big wall. Escalade Beyond Chromatic Lands. Just to talk about the it. Venice, the Venice piece, huh? Yeah. yeah. What's Did the you? question? Just to talk about it. It's wonderful. Oh, why don't you just go up and see it? <laughs> I think that's a perfect way to end today. So, Sheila, Mark, Sharon, thank you very, very much.